let's begin today's class. So last session we talked a lot about um, how when you when you draw a face in perspective, the main issue is that no one's thinking about the fact that the head itself is a three-dimensional object. So if we see the bottom of the chin, we're seeing the bottom of the nose, the bottom of the lips. So let me pull up my helper tool right here, um, resources for class, and show you what I mean. So I showed you guys this image last time. I don't know who put this together, but God bless them. Um, Wait a second, it just has to, this photo here, okay. So when a head looks up, what we always have to remember is that we're seeing the bottom of the cube that the head is in. So imagine everything is in a cube. And when we're looking at these types of setups, this is an indicator. If we're seeing this much of the low, low part of the chin, right under your jaw, right above your Adam's apple if you're a guy right here, um, we're going to see the bottom part of everything, so we forget about this. In this kind of extreme angle, three-quarter view and looking up, what happens is that we not only see the perspective applied to the cube of the head, but we also see compression, and we also see stacking. Stacking is a very important thing, though. That's something you have here. This is wonderful. For the person who painted this, very, very good job. Um, we, you're hiding the face behind, but here is the issue. We're seeing the bottom part of the chin, and this needs to be drawn with a little bit more definition. We're seeing the bottom part of this, the bottom part of this, and yet we're still seeing the top part of the eyelid. How is that possible if the top part of the eyelid, uh, eyelid is attached to a ball, and that ball has tilted away? We should see, we should, we should be seeing more of the lower part of the of the, of the lower eyelid. Um, so the upper the upper eyelid should be more hidden than the lower eyelid. That's the that's the big giveaway. When we have issues, it's for some reason all nearly all the issues when it comes to rendering eyes and drawing eyes is centered around two things people forget about: the waterline and the lower eyelid. Those are things people are always forgetting about. Okay, so that's that's something I'm going to be changing. Another thing I'm going to be changing is the placement of the brow and the eye itself. So we're we're always seeing back to this image here. We're always seeing um, a curve. So we see a curve in the way the eye sits. So usually I tell you guys draw your horizontal and vertical lines. So it's basically the vertical line between the eyes and then the two lines. When it comes to that's just on the cube though. Not everything is a straight line. And when we're actually drawing on the face, we don't put lines that are straight, we put curves, because that's how they sit. The highest point of that curve is pretty much the highest point of the symmetry line. So that's going to take me a couple tries. Maybe that's better. Um, so this part needs to be raised up a little bit. Um, another thing would be the lashes. The lashes would be much more visible. Um, from this angle, they would feel longer and so they would overlap. So remember the rule is, you're in a two-dimensional world, everyone pay attention to me right now, stop typing, pay attention to me. In the three-dimensional world, if you are painting in a canvas and you are an amazing artist, this is what you think. You think that your canvas is not flat, you think your canvas is open space. If you have this distant object and you have this object and you're trying to show that both of them are distances apart, you have to put one behind the other. And that's a tool you use. This is a tool. This is a tool in your toolkit that you can use in your paintings to, do, to express depth. So right here, the lashes aren't necessarily longer than usual. They're the same exact height, except that when we look at them straight on, we don't see the way they stick out at us because we don't have a z-axis to travel on. So we don't see the way they stick out at us because we only have these two dimensions right here, up and down, and to the sides. We don't have in and out. So we just see something like this. We see them at a much shorter stance because they're, they're elongated, they stick out. From the side view, we see eyes do this. These lashes and these lashes are the same length, but look how much longer these look. That's because the camera was in front of these eyes, and so it only saw this length. All right? So when we're looking down 
up so or they're looking down at us we're gonna see the full length of these lashes because the camera is at an angle that it can see the full length that plus exact same idea with the nose the nose from the front view we don't see it the fact that it sticks out we have to we have to look from the side and see how the nose sticks out in order to know that the nose sticks out that's why we cast such long shadows that's why the nose casts such long shadows because it's a very long protruding nose but again in this perspective your knowledge of rotation is tested and so this nose hides stuff behind it but it's not just the nose that hides stuff it's everything it's the lashes that hide stuff it's the lips that hide part of the cheek it's the lower lip that hides, hides part of the upper lip um, it's the lashes hiding yeah the upper upper eyelid it's not just that it's rotation so stuff that you usually see from front view so if her lash if her eyelid is this visible from this angle then it must be this high normally from looking front view from front view it must be like this high it must be this high that bit makes no sense if the if the eyelid is a normal sort of less than a, a third of the width of the eye then we should be seeing way less down here. So these are all cho changes that I'm going to make and, um, and I'm just trying to think where to start. I'll start with the head shape. So remember what comes first, the eyelash or the head? You, you're going to want to deal with you know the bigger object first and that's what we that's what we're going to do first, okay? All right, so when we're seeing the head from the side, we do see the way the nose, the way the, not the nose. Wow, the background color is the exact color of the brush on Liquify. So we see the uh, the bulge of the brow, the eyebrow. We see the, the, the forehead tucking in. So this is still a three-quarter view. The forehead isn't one big round jelly bean. It's 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 a cube almost. It's got edges here. So this is an edge. And it's kind of flat and it's mostly bulbous near the top, right here near the frontal lobe. Okay. And we're tucking that in, raising that cheekbone. We're seeing the bottom of the cheekbone just like the eyelid. So we're going to see that cheekbone elevated. Not that much. I'm just trying to get that edge. Liquify tool is stubborn. Okay. All right, and then I'm just talking. You see how you made the very, very slender cheek? This is you telling me that the cheek doesn't have that much fat on it. So I have to create that exact same reflection of that anatomy on the side. The nose is perfect, but because the light is shining straight onto the nose, you want to place in some light at the top of the nose, on the bridge of the nose, because that's where the light is reaching. Next thing would be to I'm going to try, I'm going to try to get this eye to be a little bit larger because we are in three quarter view so the closer eye to us gets more, um, it's larger. Alright, so we have less, uh, less eyelid visible now. <clears throat> I'm increasing the size of the lower eyelid. And now the whole eye is going to move down, or move up, sorry. I'm going to move the whole eye up and then tilt it in, because I'm, I'm thinking about that curve. And right now the eye seems to be outside of its orbit, it seems to be indented into the head excessively, because the three-quarter view is hard, plus, you know, plus this extreme perspective angle. So I'm just going to flip the canvas and figure it out. I'll, I'll fix the eyeball to look like it's looking in the same direction. And I'm always just thinking about these lines where they're sitting. See now it feels low. So this is clearly a tilt, a tilt issue as well. I'm gonna flip the canvas. I think this is good. I'm gonna do the next eye in the distance, less eyelid.
that's not what I wanted to do. Plus eyelids so this gets cropped. Okay, to hide the la to hide the transform tool, all we have to do is uh control H. What the f why did it just do that? So less upper eyelid. The upper eyelid becomes hidden behind both the eyeball and the lashes. So that's something a lot of you forget. And then the tilt. Okay. That seems to be working. And I'm just going to fill in the rest here. <clears throat> okay, I'm just tucking this in as well because it's curved. The eye is curved, so it's going to curve down. As for the lower lashes, you're going to want some. So flatten the image. And these are just going to be like uh, minor dots, a minor pattern. And this lower eyelid here stays circular. And it travels all the way. And the lash line here is really what hides away the, the, la the lid of the upper eyelid. It, it's really what hides it away. This lash line, we see the bottom of it. And sometimes there isn't always going to be a perfect black line. Sometimes there's a white line because there's a water line on the top of the lids. The upper eyelid also has one of these. And we see it when we're in this perspective. Okay. And now I'm going to do that lash change. We're going to see a lot of these lashes. If her lashes are this low, they feel burned off. They feel like they're a real lack in her anatomy. It's very unlikely. The bigger your eyes are, the bigger your lashes because there's more to protect. what the lashes job is, is to protect your eye. So I'll show you the before and after what, what's, what's been changed. Let me fix that real quick. Okay. Blend that in. Blend that in. Alright, this one is still a little bit off. I'm just going to use Liquify to fix it. It's just a simple matter of making sure that we're seeing the bulge of the eyeball in this further eye. This further eye is a little bit more compressed than this one. And this right here gets kind of tucked in like this. So let's take a look at the before and after. If you want that large upper eye look, that large upper lid, it's she from front view is going to look really tired. She's going to look really, really sleepy. Also, the eye was kind of falling off. Maybe, uh, maybe I'll keep the cheekbone the same and then put the cheekbone back in to show you how the cheekbone was. Because right now what you're telling me is that she, her cheekbone ends right there. So I raised it to show that the highlight here that we're seeing here is the same highlight here. That's symmetrical. There's something here catching light that's high enough and that's what we're trying to show on this side. And then finally we need to, oops, we need to lower down the other eye and compress it further and raise this eyebrow because we see more space in between the eyes. 
and the eyebrows in this extreme angle. So remember, don't let the way you draw the front view affect the way you draw this kind of extreme angle because it is, it's a complete change of what you know, what you think you know about how to draw eyes. It tests your, your function knowledge. It tests, it tests a lot. So this lower bulge of the lip gets raised a little bit, just a little, because we're seeing the bottom of the lip. So I just want you always to use as much of the opportunities as you can to show off that we're seeing the bottom of the cube. Because that's the point here, that we, the cube has looked up and we're seeing the bottom of that cube. Okay, so that's where we need some proof. All of this is the bottom of the cube. Alright, so a couple more changes. The symmetry here is a little bit off between this brow and the eyes. So the eyes look more awake now, definitely. I didn't tuck in the brows enough. The eyes definitely look more awake. If you wanted to go for that sleepy look, that's another story. So now I'm just going to show the chin. So we see the bulge of the chin in three quarter views. So that's a given. And then we have to find a way to connect the bulge of the chin toward the neck in this angle. So it means this little shadow you have here, that that's not there anymore. Because that shadow becomes a whole piece, and if there's light shining on it, then we don't see that shadow at all. So brush density all the way up. I've got to move this ear a little closer. Okay, tuck all that in. And then round the head off. That's something that definitely happens with a lot of students that try this angle. The head ends up being too big. So the best thing to do is just to rotate your canvas a little bit. This is why it's really good for me to ask you guys to draw without hair um, or any accessories because it shows, do you really think about the size of the head? Do you really know what the proportionate size of the head should be? So can anyone give me any other good reasons why it's good not to draw hair on your, on your form studies? I'm going to tuck this in because I don't want it to be a Nefertiti head. Okay. Because with my changes, it started to look a little bit elongated because I hadn't touched the side enough. All right, and that brow, I feel like that brow should be raised a little bit more. We are seeing the lower part of her eye, so there should be more space in between. I'm just tilting my head myself, trying to see if the chin is visible enough, if the cheek is visible enough, if it's being shown off. The nose is just perfection. The way you drew the nose, I haven't touched it at all. So you see before, after, before, after. You get too caught up in the hair and forget details on the actual face. Excellent, Grace. That's exactly what I wanted to hear. Um, the detail scope becomes becomes uh, thrown off and we start to worry about stuff that we don't have to worry about and we start to think that the hair is part of the central form of the head structure and the central anatomy. Hair is not part of the anatomy. We do not die if we're bald. So it's not part of the core structural and skeletal and anatomical and muscular structure of the face. That's why we keep it outside of our studies for a long time until we're ready to take on that texture study. Hair is part of a, a series of texture studies you do after form studies and 14-day challenges. You do dedicated hair studies. You learn how the hair pattern works. And then you combine them all and have like one big drawing. But uh, let me show you the before and after. Before, after. See how that eye was sagging off just a little bit? I haven't changed the nose, you see. 
I've kept the nose as the anchor. I've kept the nose as the indicator for the symmetry. What do you think I mean for indicator of the symmetry? Why is the nose so important not to move right now? Can anyone answer? It's another field, another type of study. Excellent, Emmanuel. Hair is another kind of study altogether. It requires its own texture study dedicated to it. And it's better to focus on that instead of sharing it with, with a face study. It's a lot easier to see if the face you're painting actually works without hair getting in the way and making you feel overly comfortable. Yeah, it can hide your mistakes and it can be used as a crutch to hide what you don't know how to paint. Um, also more efficient of a study without the hair. Yeah. And you get and you forget and you might forget shadows. Hair covers a lot of the form. Excellent. It covers the temples. Good job, Lotus. It covers the temples. It covers um, the uh, for the cheekbones, it covers the ears, it covers the jawline. So we always want to keep that out of the study for, for the time being and just focus on what needs to be focused on, which is basically the face and, and everything that have to, has to do with it. The head, the face, the symmetry, uh, the muscles, what's happening when, someone, when something has an expression. All of that can be hidden with hair or distracted. Um, also, it's a design aspect. There's a design aspect involved with hair, which is why we keep it outside of the references. We don't want to have that creative responsibility of dealing with the hair and making it look pretty. I know I I can't stand designing hair. <laughs> it's weird because I worked with hair and beauty for such a long time uh, that uh, I know like I think I'd be into that, but I'm not. Hair is just in the way of the beauties of the, of the face, which is the form. I like hair outside of the face. Um, uh, so let's see what everyone's saying. Perspective for the nose. Good job, RJ. It helps you remember that you're looking at the bottom of the nose uh, because the nose is this on the center. Good. Uh, Emmanuel, the nose is on the center, so the symmetry line hits it. So it's one of the things, one of the few things on the face that touches the symmetry line. Um, what else? The nose is the center of the face. That's how you determine the symmetry. Yes, excellent. Um, so it's looking at the perspective and it's telling us that there's stacking necessary. That there's going to be one object hiding behind the other. Which is happening right here. Alright, so if I haven't touched the nose, I the, the nose you drew, I haven't touched it. All I've done is kind of rotated everything back. So everything, so this stayed the same. Everything just kind of shifted over because everything is centering again. So what you had, the problem you had was if we looked at the nose, if we looked at this front view, this face as front view, let's place the nose right in the middle and draw some straight, straight lines. Not, not those straight lines. The lines I drew earlier, this eye would be lower than this one and it would be more indented than this one. This cheek would be fatter than this cheek. This is a this this is the 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 bastard child of of perspective and three quarter view at the same time. This is what happens when we forget that you know at one point or another we're gonna have to assess the image front view as well and test it out. When you're a three D modeler, I'm gonna ask you guys a question. When you're a three D modeler and you're drawing and you're modeling a face, is it good not to move your camera? Um, the way I'm asking it, the answer is obvious. It's not good. It's not good to not move your camera. To keep your camera stationary, you don't know how far out you've gone. So you constantly have to rotate the camera, rotate around your, you know, around the bus that you're drawing, keep the camera rotating around, moving it around, looking at the slightest little change you made, zooming out and zooming back in, and um, assessing how it looks from front view. Of course, we, we're not 3D modelers. We don't have access to a 3D modeling program. So that's always going to be our limitation. I hope Portrait Studio changes that, but uh, for now, this is the, the difficulties that we have to deal with. So because the head was too long, obviously now we see that the neck is too long. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm just going to have to draw over this. Um, so just remember that even here at this level, the eye was a little bit low, and we were seeing too much of this upper eyelid. But beautiful, beautiful studies. You did amazing. Just please remember that this, this I would even move the eye even up more. I would move it up even further. Let me see what I can do. Because it just feels like that eye was too far away from, from the anatomy and too tucked in. It felt too distant. 
It's very difficult to figure out symmetry in three-quarter view. You just have to imagine that the face is sitting on, you know, the, the face is divided into four quarters, the two front ones and then the two side ones. So these are the side ones right here, and we're seeing one, two, three. That's the three-quarter view. Um, but just because, you know, it's in a three-quarter view doesn't mean symmetry is thrown out the window because all we have to do is just imagine that these two are going to be always symmetrical, and they're going to be really close to each other, and they're part of the cube. They're part of the same face of the cube. It's this part of the cube that isn't the same face. This laser here, 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 here. They all kind of look in the same direction, except for the nose or any other shadows. All right, but this face looks forward, so it's going to be pretty easy for you to figure out how symmetry is being compressed in three-quarter view. But let me just uh, fix up this cheekbone. The cheekbone will start off earlier. As you saw, the edge of the cube starts just around here not any lower, so that's where that shadow starts. And then the cheekbone highlight. Okay. Just like this, and that beard shadow ends at the corner of the lips. So you always have to think about the cube. It helps you decide. You know, if I knew that the cube helps us decide where to place shadows, that's basically blending. The cube helps you blend better. That's amazing. That's exactly what we want out of a you know a helping tool in art. Something that teaches me where to put my shadows and where to blend them and where to make them edges and where not to blend. That's what the cube does. So yeah, I'm always saying cube, but understand why I'm always talking about the cube. The cube is the real world. The cube has the z-axis embedded in it. So you don't have to go and worry about the mathematics of the z-axis. You just have to say cube and it'll be taken care of. Right here, this edge that you had was a little bit too extreme. You just need it on the edge right here. And this ear is a little far away. It needs to be just a little closer, just around there. And that'll be the end of this critique. So it might be a quick class today, actually, because not much uh, face homework or perspective homework. But do you see how, you know, throwing off studies for, for masterpieces is like the worst thing you can do? Because you will make all of these mistakes, but on a masterpiece. So you'll have hair. <laughs> Trust me, let me tell you what you'll have. You'll have hair. All right, you'll have freckles and pores, you'll have long lashes, you'll have details, you'll have earrings, you'll have a magic spell, you'll have a wand, you'll have, you know, all that stuff, and then you're going to have to go back on top of all that detail and go into liquefy and distort. That's terrible. That's terrible. You never want to put yourself in that kind of situation, and not just that. Here's the rub. It will all be in color. <laughs> so you're going to you're going to be looking at all of these mistakes with color. You're going to be dealing with all of them. So I didn't touch the nose. I just gravitated everything towards that nose. All right? The head was a little bit large and uh not a little bit, a lot. It was a lot large. <laughs> it was very large. I have no grammar. One thing that can be illuminated on the edge of the chin is the, you know, this jawline right here. If the light reaches it, and you can cheat sometimes. There are times when you can cheat. Let me just move this ear. Right over here. A little bit closer and this I mean I could work on it a little bit more but for time's sake I can't okay that file is empty all right so before after and when you do this is a beautiful way that you've done the nostrils here when you do the edge of the lips just remember that we're looking at it from our angle so we just want to see that you've done the cave so you shrink your brush the closer you get to the actual edge. So under it there will be highlights because they're looking up. Just like this. 
and then this part of the lip looks down so this starts off as a shadow all the way up sorry I'm losing my voice <clears throat> okay and then the cast shadow and then the cupid's bow be a little illuminated here okay so before after any questions <clears throat> just uh, I'll write that ears are so far and Esta moves it yeah yeah anyone can see these issues you don't have to be like crazy to, like uh, good at art to see um, the simplest mistakes we all see proportion day to day so someone who doesn't know how to draw um, can see mistakes so it doesn't hurt to show this to anyone in your family anyone who lives with you or your friends it's not always an artist that has to see it but you have your community it's full of artists so might as well go to the source um, so it's glitching my internet's been really bad in this area we've been having lots of storms and it's been terrible it's been so cold so uh, that might be like the internet just dropped today for like 10 minutes Um, so let's see if anyone's asking anything. Is the back of the head too dark? It is a little too dark because she's in a bright room. You see the color here. She's in a bright room, so that, that might be um, too dark. Should the jawline be more defined? Um, no, not defined. A little bit more, a little less defined. Less like a line because we're seeing the lower part now. So it all turns into gradients again. We should be seeing, though, um, a cast shadow. inverse we should be seeing something like this okay and I'm just going to lighten up that part of the head the neck is a little thick at this point but it's okay so before after. Do you see how extreme these changes are? And look at the change in the nose when we added that top part. This I did last stream as well. Please don't forget about this top part right here. It's very important, you guys. Don't forget about the top part of the nose. The nose is the most cube-like object on the face. It has the most remnants of the cube in it. Alright. It's very important you guys just always like link back to the cube. <clears throat> okay. Um, her brows are a little low, but she, that you know brows come in those, all kinds of shapes and sizes. So we should be seeing a little bit of an arc from this angle, something like that with a little bit of light under it. Um, but if that's not how her eyebrows are, then we simply won't see that. They can be low. And before after. Alright, do you see what I did here with the cheek? Can anyone explain what I did with the cheek? Alright, so you see this change right here? Compared to where it was before, which was right here. What happened? Can anyone explain it? <clears throat> there is a lag, so I just have to wait for your answers. I'm just going to read a little. How is my brush supposed to be set? Do I take transfer off to make things more opaque with my strokes? No, you can just press harder. You can leave transfer on. I leave transfer on all the time. Sometimes I turn transfer off because it's a little bit in my way. But just keep keep yourself acquainted, well acquainted with your brush settings. And uh, don't be so afraid um, to, you know, constantly be changing your brush stroke. Don't be... Uh, don't think that once the brush has been made, that's it, it can't be touched. Always change it according to how you're feeling that day. Sometimes I start drawing and a brush, which I've been using for months straight, feels completely alien to me. It feels like I've never used this brush before. So it is, uh, it is in your right and in your power to go in and change the brush as you feel, as you, as you want to. Just, you know, your tool is your tool, so you're going to have to adjust it as you need it. That's what it's there for. It has been done. 
It has a bone underneath now, yes. Um, uh, RJ, don't depend on how many views you get to move on. Go to hair when you've gotten good at the head. Try a 14-day study when you go do when you do go to hair. Yeah, that's also good. A sudden change in the light. Face triangle, there's one. Define the edge, excellent. The face isn't sliding off and it's on the skeleton. Good job, RJ. It fits the bone structure now. Moved it towards the symmetry line, excellent. Sorry, my tea box fell. Uh, reduce the prominence of the cheekbone. Um, no, induce the prominence of the cheekbone. We've added it. The cheeks stick to the cheekbone and it is in this case and in this case, it's on the light side of the cube. Yes. This, the face is slimmer now. So it's so can anyone, like the light side of the cube, when you say the cheeks stick to the cheekbone, this, the, what you should be saying, Felipe, um, the cheeks are the edge of the cube. And after the cheekbones, we have the light side of the cube. So this is what I mean. The cheeks are on the edge of the cube. All right. So this is the edge, and this is the cube edge, sorry, and this is the light side. So you're right about the light side, absolutely. And that's what I did. You know, the, the light side hasn't changed, the, the deep bone that, that you had. So here, it felt like you were doing this. This is why this, this was a shadow. But after, we kind of gave it the cheekbone, it was really indicating, and it became less... Um, kind of less uh, of, an, of an actual indentation. It didn't feel like a whole more of a, of a gentle slide down. And it doesn't really slide down. It, it's a very, the cheekbone is, is not is not an indentation in the skeleton. It's not a hole in the skeletal level. It's, it's a height. It's a peak. It's a mountain. And then everything after that goes down. And this is the peak of the mountain. This is why it's important for us to catch the light right here, where it is highest. So remember, the mountain peaks are what catch the, the light. All right, this is not as bright. This mountain is not as bright as this mountain. And the nose is like 90%. The forehead is the highest, and the cheeks are the third. All right, so before, after. Um, I think I'll be doing just this one critique. It's kind of like a reiteration of what we studied before. Um, this is about face symmetry. It's not really about angle, so I'll be talking about this next time, hopefully. Does anyone have any other questions? Why don't you try a Cintiq? A Cintiq. It's a, a lot of digital artists tell me it's a great difference. I don't think... I've tried one. I've used one. Um, I've used my friends, and I don't really feel in touch with it. I also have a tablet and a pen to use it with on the um, Autodesk thingy that you can use on the Android. And uh, I know the pen pressure difference is huge compared to a Cintiq and an Android tablet, but um, I don't feel comfortable with that. I, I feel like I've learned everything about my hand weight, the way I hold a pen, so comfortably now that if I were to go back to the sketchbook or go back to the canvas, um, it would it would just completely disrupt all my techniques. So I'm okay with my Intuos tablet. Also, a Cintiq is a lot of trouble coordinating and cal calibrating. Sorry, the colors to match. Um, then there's the pen. Then you have to wear the glove, and that's just like another obstacle. Um, I think you do for the old pieces, for the old ones. I'm not sure, but. Um, the color issue and then the brightness. The brightness is really high on the Cintiq and if you lower the brightness you lose color. So I can lower the brightness on my HP monitor here and I won't lose a lot of color but I notice on the Cintiq if you lower the brightness you lose so much color. It's like a TV. It's that, That's the kind of screen it is. It's very similar to like um, iPhone screen. So when I'm painting I can't deal with that brightness and that loss of color. Uh, so I just bother not, I don't work with it. Plus, I like my keyboard as being my central, you know, hub, like my, my, um, my command center. So I, I can memorize the shortcuts and the, and the hotkeys of a keyboard instead of calibrating them to a tablet every time I go to a new computer. Because I've got three computers in my house, so I'd rather just get used to the keyboard instead of constantly setting up the Wacom assistance, whatever thingy it is, the desktop thingy. Um, every time I go to a new computer. So I like getting used to the keyboard. I don't want to get used to buttons on a, on a tablet or features on a tablet or have a third monitor to be staring at. I like having the two monitors that I look at. This is not necessarily me asking you guys to change your setup. You know, whatever you're comfortable with, whatever gets you to paint, do your thing. 
That's my opinion on Centix. <laughs> um, this is a bit complicated for what time we have, but how would you go about drawing a face from below? Um, what do you mean? Well, well it's, you draw the sketch, you sketch out the cube, and you sketch out the front part of the cube, and then you draw your symmetry lines, and then you fit the eyes in those symmetry lines, and then you start to carve away and bring in the organic patterns. Um, and then you have, you know, you're well on your way to getting your, your <clears throat> large blocking in. You start blocking in your shadows, the large cast shadows from large pieces, so the nose, the socket, the lip, the upper lip, uh, the, the uh, upper lip, and then the lower lip shadow. Um, if everything else falls into place after that if you're working with a reference. So that's it. Thanks everyone for coming. Have a great day. Another tea box fell. Bye-bye. <laughs>